We're studying Hebrews chapter 3 tonight, and we're talking about the glories of Christ. I have to emphasize to you, and you already know this, I know, but I want to underscore this, that uh, although the Bible is inspired, the chapter divisions and the verse divisions are not. They were developed uh, several hundred years ago by a printer who wanted to make it easier for people to find things in the Bible. And so those chapter and verse divisions sometimes get in the way because these books were written as one book and sometimes the chapter divisions are in the wrong place. And, and such is the case here tonight. Verses one through six are pre- probably really m- more properly associated with what we're reading about in chapter two. But anyway, we have it the way it is, and so we're going to deal with it this way. Uh, I just want you to know that, that you really kind of have to look at the book of Hebrews or any other book in the Bible as a book in itself from beginning to end. So tonight we're going to be talking about the glories of Christ. We talked about the excellency of the gospel the first week. The second week we talked about the preeminence of Christ. And tonight we're going to look at the glories of Christ. We're in Hebrews chapter three, beginning at verse one. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also (coughs) Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for uh, your Holy Spirit who is with us here tonight. We ask you, Lord, to move on our hearts and uh, uh, help us, Lord, to understand what you would speak to us tonight. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the glories of Christ. We'll begin tonight talking about Jesus, who is our great high priest. You notice that Jesus is is called an apostle here? Isn't that interesting? Now you think of the apostles as being the 12 or maybe add Peter in there, add Barnabas in there. They had a few other apostles. But Jesus is called the apostle with a capital A and the high priest of our profession. You know, Christians ought rightly to have their high priest, their apostle, if I could say that, Jesus Christ, continually in their thoughts, continually. He should be the object of close and serious consideration. No one on earth or in heaven deserves as much consideration as Jesus does. Now, by saying consideration, I mean simply think about him. Think about him. Can I tell you, I I hope this will encourage you, that I think about each of you throughout the week. I think about Jenny, I think about Ed, I think about Ron, I think about Carol, I think about Carol, I think about you. I hope you think about me. (laughs) But you know, we ought to be thinking and considering the Lord Jesus Christ all the time. The apostle begins here by addressing Christians as holy brethren. Oh, I like that. You know, the world may scoff at such words when they observe the ways some professing Christians behave themselves. You know, you and I have to admit that although there should be holiness in the church, There's a lot of bad behavior in there. And it can bring uh, 
scorn and ridicule onto the church. But I have news for you. Holiness is nothing to joke about. And those who do joke about it need to watch out. Let me tell you, true Christians are indeed holy in God's eyes. Did you know that? They're holy not because of their own works or their own merit, but they're holy because they've been made holy by their faith in the substitutionary work of Christ on the cross. And you better watch it. You may want to say, but you don't know what they did. I know what's behind that. You better be careful because you don't know that sin that you're pointing out may be under the blood of Christ. And shame on you for trying to bring it out. You're putting yourself in the position of the accuser of the brethren. Love covers a multitude of sin. Christians are those who have been called out of darkness. You know what that means? You were in darkness before. And we've been brought into the marvelous light of the gospel. We have been transformed and we have been sanctified people, set apart for God's glory. True Christians, we're not sinners anymore, but we used to be. And God changed us. And we say hallelujah for that. He's merciful. And we are the redeemed ones, the forgiven ones, the cleansed ones. We're the ones that couldn't see. Now our eyes are open. We couldn't walk, but now our legs work. He saved us. Now it's to such people that the apostles give instructions to the holy brothers. He wants us to give some serious consideration to the glories of their Lord. And as I mentioned, it says Jesus is called the apostle and the high priest of our profession. That simply means he's the, he's the principal messenger sent by God to reconcile mankind to the heavenly father. And today as high priest, he intercedes for us so that we can receive pardon for sin and acceptance with God the Father. Jesus is seated in heaven right now, there on your behalf and on my behalf. <laughs> We're called holy brethren. My goodness. It's important for believers to seriously consider what Jesus is in himself and what he is to them now and what he will be to them throughout eternity. There's so much to Jesus, and we're wise to fix our thoughts on him with the greatest of attention. And we ought to act toward him accordingly, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Do you know, I think many people who profess faith in Christ have not given him due and serious consideration you're talking about the king of glory here. You're talking about the God who made the heavens and the earth. You're talking about the king of kings and Lord of lords, the one with the burning eyes and the, the, that when John saw him in Revelation, he fell at his feet as if dead. It's important to seriously consider who he is. I don't think he's thought of as often as he should be. As often as he deserves to be thought of. And maybe not even as often as he desires to be thought of. Now think about you and your spouse. Come on, admit with me, you've probably said something like this to your spouse. Well, how come you don't ever think about me? <laughs> something like that. There's nothing wrong with wanted to, wanting to be thought about. Have your spouse think about you. You want them to care for you and think about you. Can I tell you something? Jesus deserves to be thought about and he desires to be thought about by those who expect salvation from him. You belong to him. Notice here that even those who are called holy brethren 
those who are partakers of the heavenly calling, they need to stir themselves up and stir one another up to think more about Christ than they presently do. Sadly, I think even the best of his people think too seldom and too lightly of him. Take time to think about him. I told you I was given a special watch by Jerry and uh, the instructions he gave to me were, Dave, I want you to set the watch's timer to go off every hour on the hour during the waker, waking hours. And every time that buzzer goes off, Jerry told me, I want you to turn your thoughts toward God and check in with the Lord through prayer. That might sound like a corny thing, but I've been doing it for the last couple of days. And uh, so far, it's proved to be a good little reminder. I'm really finding myself just thanking the Lord, giving him my attention. Now, I actually give him my attention more than every hour on the hour, but um, it doesn't hurt for that alarm to be going off. You know, we owe him more of our attention. We must think about Christ as he is described to us in the scriptures and not create a false God or create any vain concepts about the Lord on our own. You know, I told you the picture of Christ that you have in the book of Revelation is far different than the good shepherd holding the sheep or Jesus holding the children. He's not that now. He's seated on the right hand of power. He's glorious. And we need to think about him. I'm going to give you a few things about Jesus that you could seriously think about. You ready? Here's number one. How about this? How about if you think of his faithfulness? He is faithful first to his heavenly father, and then he's faithful to you and me. Think about his faithfulness. Consider it. Mull it over in your mind. You know what? You can depend on him. There aren't very many people you can depend on in this world. You know that. Even people that love you. How many people have disappointed you? Oh, I know I said I'd get that to you, but I, I, I forgot. We say, oh, that's okay. And then we turn around and go, you know, I forgot. <laughs> Can I tell you something? Jesus doesn't forget. He's faithful. He will do what he says he will do. He's faithful to his father and he's faithful to you. Here's another thing to think about. That he is a mediator who is fully acceptable to the father. He's there speaking on your behalf right now. And he's your representative, your lawyer, if you will, in the courts of heaven. And he's fully acceptable to the Father. Here's something else for you to think about when you think of Jesus. He is superior in glory and excellence to any other creature in heaven or on earth. He's not a creature. He's the creator God. But he's more glorious and more he's superior to all other beings. Maybe you haven't thought about this before. Here's something else to think about. That Jesus is building his church. That is the people of God who are joined together under his leadership. He's building it. He's putting it all together. You know what else he's doing? He's building a place for us to live eternally in his father's house. Amen. Think about these things. When you think about Jesus, you can think about this. I, I don't know. I, I doubt that we're going to have bathrooms in heaven. I don't know. <laughs> They're pretty important down here, aren't they? But Jesus, I wonder how much my mansion you got ready. <laughs> Is the bathroom done? What's the kitchen look like? You know, he's working on something. Now, I'm being... A little silly, but not too silly. Because we've got, we've got a mansion that he's preparing for us, a place that he's preparing for us. 
You say, well, will we have a bedroom? I don't know. Are we going to sleep? I don't know. Perfect. Well, whatever it is, though, it's going to be perfect. Lord, you're building not only your church on earth, but you're working on our behalf in heaven right now. And do you know what? Here's something else to think about. Since Christ is the master of his own house, as well as its maker, when I talk about his own house, I'm talking about the body of Christ here. He can be trusted and greatly appreciated by all those who are under his care. Boy, is he good. Well, now let's go to chapter um, three, but we're going to go to verse seven. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works for 40 years. Now you can tell here, we've kind of changed subjects, haven't we? So the, the chapter division probably should be right there, but we won't argue about it. Just recognize it. Verse 10. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, God says. <clears throat> and I said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren. Who's he writing to? The brethren, the holy brethren that he mentioned earlier. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. If we would only do that. Yeah. I mean, Ron, this is possible for holy brethren to be have hardened hearts through the deceitfulness of sin. Look, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. <laughs> While it is said today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation. For some, when they heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses but with whom he was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Wow. That's why Hebrews is not read that much as much as it should be because this stands in direct contrast to a lot of people's theology we need to give heed to some very serious counsel and some very serious cautions that the apostle is giving us here in these verses he counsels believers to give speedy an active attention to the word of Christ. If God tells you to do something, do it. We are to hear his voice in his word. We have his word. Remember, Peter said he was talking about um, the transfiguration. And he, he said, we heard the voice on the mountain. And then Peter follows it up by saying, but we, now we have a more sure word of prophecy. A more sure word than a voice on the mountain? Yeah, this book right here is a more sure word, even than some personal revelation. We have the word of God. We can hear his voice speaking to us individually through that word. And we need to assent to the truth of the word of God Agree that it is written by God, written as it is written, don't change it. And consider what God in Christ is saying to us through it all, and us individually too. Can I tell you something? Turning a deaf ear to the calls and counsels of Christ, that's a deadly thing for anybody. How many times 
has it been with you when you open up, you have, you're talking to somebody that claims to be a Christian, you open up the word of God and you say, look, this is what it says. And they'll say, well, that's your interpretation. Mm-hmm. No. no, that's what it says. That's a dangerous thing to just determine and say, well, I, I know what it says, but I'm not doing that. Turning a deaf ear to the calls and counsels of Christ is a deadly thing. When he tells mankind of the evil of sin and the excellency of holiness and the necessity of receiving him by faith as Savior, mankind must not shut their ears and hearts to his voice. No, don't do that. Do you know why? Because you end up with a hard heart. A hardening of heart proceeds from sin and leads to more sin and destruction. And it's illustrated in the downfall of the rebellious Israelites in the wilderness. Take a, take a look at those rebellious Israelites. They were in bondage. God set them free, brought them through the, the, the sea on dry land. It's a picture of baptism, by the way. Now they're out in the wilderness and God, and they don't have anything, but God's providing for them. Gives them water, gives them meat, gives them bread, takes care of them, leads them with a fire by night, pillar of fire by night, and a pillar of cloud by the day. He's leading them, he's walking, and he takes them right up to the edge of the promised land. And he says, go in. And they say, no, we won't do it. We won't do it. And it was their downfall for a whole generation for 40 years. Now, this is an example for us. God often allows trials in our lives, like he did with those ancient Israelites, to test us, to see if we really and entirely depend on him. The sins of others and the tragic results that followed their sins should be a warning to us The Israelites in the wilderness, they tempted the Lord because of their unbelief. And this is an example to us. And I say, oh, Lord, help me. I don't want to do that. It's easy to do. You look at the giants. You look at the difficulty. You look at yourself. And you say, I can't do it. But God, don't look at don't look at yourself. You look at God. Well, the Israelites in the wilderness tempting God the way they did. This is an example to us. They provoked God. They distrusted God. They murmured against God and they murmured against God's man, Moses. And they would not attend to the voice of the Lord, even though he had personally witnessed his wonder-working power to them in delivering them out of Egypt. And he was continuously supporting them and supplying for them in the wilderness from day to day. And yet they continued in their sin against God. And you know why Uh, or how they did it? By complaining. Friends, I got news for you. 40 years worth of complaining, that's a lot of complaining. (laughs) That doesn't sound like fun, does it? You know you can get into a funk where you just start complaining about everything. And boy, you hope it doesn't last four days. But for that to last for 40 years, what bitter, angry, mean people they must have been. And you wouldn't have wanted to be around them. We're like that until we're saved. Well, these folks, this is the thing, though. These, it's an example to us who are called holy brethren. Mm-hmm. So we've got to be careful here that we don't slide into this. You know, Carolyn and I have made mention before, perhaps, to you uh, that in the 25 years that we've spent in nursing home ministry, uh, the we've found some very weak Christians in their old age. 
uh, maybe that have been walking with the Lord supposedly uh, most of their life. Because when they get weak and old and poorer and weaker and sicker, a lot of them go into unbelief. Well, God has abandoned me or something like that or, uh, you know. And and you know what they, they become? Bitter. Bitter and complainers. The opposite of that is a woman I'll call Mina. She was in her 90s and Mina was, had a lot of physical problems. But Mina was as happy as a bird in a tree. And she was just full of joy, the joy of the Lord. It was her strength. She witnessed and spoke to people up and down the aisle in that nursing home. What a wonderful woman Mina was. But she was different. She didn't complain. She just served the Lord with gladness and joy. I want to be like her. But these people in the wilderness, they just complain, complain, complain. And you know what? God was rightly grieved. He was rightly grieved with that generation in the wilderness. He did have great patience with them. He didn't wipe them out right away, you know. He let them wander around. But do you know this about sin and unbelief? Sin and unbelief in a believer particularly, it does anger God. God is angry with the wicked every day. But it's also an affront to him. It grieves him. When you grumble and complain and murmur. I don't, I shouldn't say when you do it. Let me say when we do it. Because I'm prone to do this. My wife is listening to this message today. And she's saying, you know, that's bouncing right off that platform or that pulpit right back in your face, Dave. Don't you know that? Yeah, I know. We need to stop complaining. Now, God doesn't have any desire to destroy his people in or for their sins. He doesn't want to do that. He's not willing that any should perish. He has a heart of mercy. His mercy is new every morning, the Bible tells us. He is long-suffering toward us, and he's gracious even to those who reject him. In time, however, if sinners persist in their sins and continue to grieve his spirit, God will allow those sins to become grievous to their own spirits, either in the way of judgment or in the way of mercy. Sin will eventually kindle the divine wrath of God If we persist in our sin, in his judgment, God will pour out his wrath on those who refuse to repent of sin and turn to him for mercy. Now God's wrath against sinners will eventually come, we know, but it will not come rashly, but it will come righteously and no one will be able to resist it. You're not going to be able to stand before God and say, you're not being fair to me. We need to take heed. The apostle warned, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to Christians. That's what we got to keep in mind. The apostle warns us all to be on guard against enemies, both within and without. Look, we're battling the world, the flesh, and the devil. Enemies within, enemies without. God is no respecter of persons, the Bible tells us. As God dealt with the rebellious children of Israel in the past, he will do the same to you and me if we follow their pattern, their example. We need to take heed. It's interesting to me in this portion of scripture how The apostle is emphasizing how Christ is much greater than Moses. The ruin of Israel should be a warning to us to take heed of our standing uh, with God. Because Jesus is far greater than Moses. If the destruction of the rebellious Israelites came in the wilderness 
came as a result of their opposing and murmuring against Moses. As an example to us, how much more will it come against us if we complain and murmur against Jesus Christ? Uh, Well, I'll tell you, it's an example we dare not forget. We forget it at our own uh, peril. Now, it's mentioned here in another portion of Scripture, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. Here's what we read there. The Apostle Paul says this, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, neither be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You know, that's about as clear as it can get. You better take heed. You know, the sin of unbelief is a bad thing. It's a bad thing. The heart of unbelief is an evil heart. And an evil heart of unbelief is really at the bottom of all our sinful wanderings away from God. Unbelief is a leading step toward apostasy. If we allow ourselves, listen carefully to this one. If we allow ourselves to distrust God, we may soon find ourselves deserting him. You can trust him. You must trust him. That's what it is to have faith in Christ. And you say, well, the world needs to be warned about this. No, no, listen. Christians have a need to be warned and cautioned against this type of apostasy. He says, let those that think they stand heed lest they fall. It's possible to be counted as one of the children of God, to be in the company of the modern day Israelites, and yet to be lost in unbelief when you think you're okay. Boy, that's a clear and concise warning from Paul, isn't it? Christians should be doing all the good they can do to one another while they're together in this earth. Life on earth is short and uncertain and none of us is promised tomorrow. We need to do the best we can and make the best of today. But let me just tell you, there is a great deal of deceitfulness in sin. Sin can fool you. Sin appears to be fun. It appears to be fun in the beginning, but actually it's not fun, it's filthy. Sin appears to be pleasant, but it's not pleasant, it's pernicious. There's a good word for you. Sin promises much, but delivers nothing but death. Sin can harden the soul. And you know what happens with one sin? usually leads to another. And therefore, sin should be of great concern to everyone who wants to please God and live with him forever in heaven. We need to hold on to the end. That's what the scripture tells us here. 
hold on the, to the end. The writer of Hebrews comforts those who not only set out well and start out well, but they have to hold on well to the end. You got to finish well. These are the ones who are made partakers of Christ, who hold the beginning of their confidence steadfast to the end. True followers of Christ will persevere because they will be kept by the mighty power of God through faith and salvation. Such warnings against apostasy as we find in this chapter are warnings uh, <clears throat> by which Christ can help his people to persevere. This warning tends to make God's people watchful and diligent. And so it keeps them from apostasy. When we were in Missouri with my sister, we went to a Japanese steakhouse. If you've never been to one of those, I suggest you go. It's very good food. And it's actually a lot of fun to watch these cooks flip the things around and set the little onions on fire and they do all these different things. But what you have in front of you, if you've been there before, you know, there's this hot, hot metal stove. That's a, just a grill, hot grill, right in front of you. And uh, we had some friends one time that took their whole family there and they had a little girl who was about six years old. And you know, right there, she got so excited. She was just so happy that she took her hand and went, <laughs> and she screamed out. Now you say, well, I would never do anything that dumb. <laughs> well, I have news for you. That's a picture of sin. And um, it may look good. It may look like something that you want to try, but let me tell you, you don't want to try it. And the Lord here gives true Christians warnings against apostasy because he wants you to be diligent. He wants you to be watchful. He wants you to keep you from that. He wants you to walk in belief. You know this as well as I do, that there are many people, a great many people, who in the beginning of their profession of Christ, they look good and they show a great deal of courage and they show a great deal of confidence. But then as the years go by, as we were mentioning earlier, they grow cold or something, or lukewarm. And they don't hold on to Christ in the same way until the end. Can I tell you something? Persevering faith is the best evidence of true saving faith that there is. Through the majority of wilderness wanderings, these Unbelieving Israelites provoked God with their unbelief. Yet, not all of them. There was a few, Joshua and Caleb. They didn't provoke God because they didn't walk in unbelief. <laughs> they heard the words of God and they believed him. And they followed him and they trusted him. You see, hearing the word of God is the usual means of salvation. But if it is what is if what is heard is not hearkened to, then it will expose men even more to the anger of God and the wrath of God. God is grieved with those to, that who claim to be His people, and yet they continue in sin. Let me say that again. God is grieved with those who claim to be Christians and yet continue in their sin. God is not mocked. God is not fooled. You're only fooling, you're not fooling anybody else either who knows you. You're only fooling yourself. When sin becomes a habitual thing, it is most provoking to God. And although God grieves for a long time, 
and he is very long suffering and he puts up with sin, eventually the Bible tells us he'll stop striving with man and then comes judgment. Don't make a God of your own brain. God says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Don't make any idols. Don't make up a God in your mind. What we've been reading here, this is the God who created the universe warning us. Unbelief is the great damning sin of the world especially for those who have had a revelation of the mind and will of God in their lives. You know, the most dangerous place to, to, to be is in a church where it preaches the gospel and you get hard to it and you don't hear it and you don't obey it and you don't follow it. And you're like those unbelieving Israelites. Wow, this kind of sin shuts up the heart of God and shuts up the gates of heaven against the unbeliever. Unbelief places people under the wrath and curse of God and will leave them there forever. Oof. Well, as we close tonight, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles with me to Psalms 95. Psalms 95, verses 6 through 11. And Ron, I know this is a song also. This is a modern song. It's been put to music. Maybe we could sing it sometime. But I want you to just read along with me as I read it for you. It's uh, Psalm 95, verses 6 through 11. I have it up here on the screen if you want to just follow there. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Now, wait a second. Stop right there for a minute. Who's singing this song? Christians, right? (laughs) Or people that belong to the Lord. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation. And as in the days of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, Proved me and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation. I said, it is a people that do err in their heart. And they have not known my ways. Unto whom I swear in my wrath. That they should not enter into my rest. We sing that song, but we only sing the first couple of verses. The first couple of lines. Sounds a little bit rougher when you get down to the second part, doesn't it? Unbelief is a, is a bad thing. We need to trust the Lord and know that all the way my Savior leads me, he's going to take us all the way home. We just follow him. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I, I don't need anything else. The Lord is my shepherd. He, he'll lead me all the way. All I have to do is trust him Amen. and believe in him. Amen. What I have to do is I have to be a Joshua or a Caleb. And I can even make it through 40 years in the wilderness. Because I'm having to deal with these other yahoos. (laughs) But God took care of his own, didn't he? He took care of his own and he'll take care of us too. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you as we look into your word that we see the glories of Christ. We see how wonderful you are. And yet, Lord, here is this example of unbelief that leads to apostasy. Oh, God, keep us from that. Strengthen us, Lord, and help us, Lord, to turn from sin and to follow you all the days of our life. Strengthen us to that end and keep my friends here tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.